Hello and welcome to the Brutal Iron Gym Podcast, where our goal is to cut through the BS and deliver the brutal truth about topics related to health and happiness. So today's topic is trainer education, and we're going to be talking about simplifying the process. So, often when clients come to us as trainers, they're already feeling overwhelmed with information. So back whenever I first started training people, uh, internet had just kind of um, became accessible to our local area in the sense of like dial up internet in our homes and that was the, I think when I was like 16 maybe 17 and um it was slow as hell to download anything so I remember like a 20 minute lifting video would take maybe two hours so there really wasn't um as much access to information as there is today so back in my day, <laughs> makes you sound old, uh, We I would get a magazine every month. So I remember my parents would take me into town, I'd get a magazine. This makes me sound like I had a, like dinosaurs a pet, holy hell. Uh, <laughs> but we would we would go into the local town, and uh, I would get a magazine for the month. It was usually men's fitness uh, at first, and then I switched to muscular development, which seemed like kind of like the... Like almost like the bad boy book because it talked about like drugs and supplements and had, you know, more bodybuilder type people. And uh, it seemed like kind of the, the one you had to like graduate to. And it was almost like the hardcore magazine of the day. So I would read that and typically I'd get it and they would only come out every month. So I would have it, the whole damn thing read within the first week. And then I'd kind of try all the things like that first week, maybe the second week. I'd be bored by the third, kind of like by the fourth, I'm doing random crap and not really learning anything. And then by the next month, I'd all of a sudden get the next book and do through the same process. So uh, it was very, very slow to get information. The benefit of that, though, was it was so slow, it forced you to actually have to do the information. So since you weren't going to get anything new for a month, you might as well just try the stuff that was in it. Well, with today's technology, people can get information instantly a million times over, and it's almost so much overwhelming information that they'll start one thing, they'll hear a new piece of information, start the next thing, before the last thing even had an effect. So, like, they would, like, how, how often do we know people starting diets every month? I mean, or every week. So, people have training programs and... Maybe it's supposed to be an 8 to 12 week program, but three weeks in they think they figured it out and all of a sudden they're going to modify things and change things. So I've done that myself when I was younger and when the internet became kind of more uh, accessible, especially when I went to college and we had a thing called Ethernet. And it was like the most amazing thing where you download uh, songs off Napster, which turned out to be a bad thing. <laughs> but we'd all download songs off Napster, make CDs and sell them, um, which was illegal. Yeah, but it was a ton of information, and all of a sudden there started becoming that process of getting more information that you actually never really learned if what you were reading was true. So I think one of the worst things of today's culture is people read things and assume it's true just because it was written down. Oh my God, that is not even remotely close to actually um, a standard of truth anymore. So things don't have to be a verif verified to be written anymore. So maybe they never were, but it seemed like before you would read something, you'd have time to practice it, and you'd learn if it was real or not, right or not. Whereas today, people just simply reading it, they think it's true. So over people feel overwhelmed when they come to us in, in today's day and age, and everything they hear seems to be contradictory because you have asshole authors who try to get like clicks and try to get interest in their article, so they'll write stuff that's purposely... Um, falsified or kind of overblown just so they can seem like they stand out above the crowd so those people are complete assholes and I probably need to swear stop swearing so much in these podcasts but it just frustrates the hell out of me that they don't care if what they're writing is actually helpful as much as they care about getting clicks and likes and you know getting interest in the article so they're just a piece of shit human being because they're not actually interested in helping anybody. They just want to help themselves. And in the process of helping themselves, they're hurting others. I wouldn't care if they were just going to screw themselves over. Fine, whatever, that's your choice. But if you're going to screw other people over just to get yourself ahead, you're a piece of shit. So I can't stand when people write those type of articles or make those type of videos. It's just, oh, it's so, so, so frustrating that human beings can be like that. It's just very disappointing and very frustrating.
So our job as trainers is to not be that pe those people, okay? We don't want to overwhelm our clients with information. The goal is actually to simplify things. Now, I do understand whenever you're younger in training or even some people who have kind of a, um, I don't know about like necessarily saying it a weak mindset, but if they're worried about self-confidence and they're struggling with themselves as a trainer in terms of like showing their worth and knowing if they're good or not, sometimes people feel the need to present an enormous amount of information to show that they know a lot. And what I want to argue in this podcast is that actually that's the opposite of knowledge. Just because you memorized a lot of things that you read doesn't mean you know them to be true. And it absolutely doesn't mean you actually know the content. Just because I can spit out some facts that I read in a book doesn't mean I know the facts. I don't know the ins and outs, the true nuances of them. I don't even know if they're right or not. Just because you read things, memorized them, and spewed them back out to other people doesn't mean it's actual knowledge. So actual knowledge is learning how to take an enormous amount of information and simplify it. So that's our job. Our job is to not continue the overwhelming nature of information that's out there in today's kind of culture, but instead to simplify, simplify the process for them. So we want to decipher through the chaos and give them key points to focus on specific to where they are and where they want to be. That's our job as trainers, is to simplify the process. So, here's an example, is I had someone come to me for a weight loss diet, and they told me um, everything about their life, and the chaos that they had going on. And what it equated to was they ate McDonald's on the way to work, they ate McDonald's or some type of fast food at lunch, and they ate McDonald's on the way home, and then at night, sometimes they would get a snack, sometimes they wouldn't. And typically, I would tell the person is, you know, whatever the hell's going on in your life, you're not special, you can figure out better ways to eat. Uh, this person actually had some pretty crazy circumstances, so I don't want to share all the details. But they had a child with special needs, they had some other issues going on, and their mornings were, um, it, it, they were doing what they needed to do in the moment to balance what was presented to them in people that needed their control and their care. So in a sense of like a child with special needs, you can't, you know, just tell them to dress themselves. You can't tell them to feed themselves. So they really had a lot of responsibilities before work. They tried to cram in their work and they had to get done uh, earlier than their traditional work day so they could take care of other needs in the evening. So they actually worked through a lunch hour and uh, their boss actually allowed them to take 30 minutes uh, where they actually got paid to go grab something for lunch and come back. Um, you know, so it was it was a pretty damn uh, rough life in the sense of what they're going through at the moment. So there was really no way to get them off of the McDonald's value meal. So they didn't have a lot of time for food prepping. There was all this other chaos going on. And this person was already on the verge of kind of just breaking down. So I decided, and this doesn't mean it was necessarily the right choice, but it, it struck me as an okay choice at the time, was instead of fighting them on those issues, we decided, okay, well, if you're going to eat at McDonald's, how can you eat at McDonald's healthier than what you're doing now? So if we need to get your blood markers down, if we need to get cholesterol down, you know, if we need to get... Um, you know, sugars and all this other stuff. They basically had a lot of health problems going on. So we decided to create a diet through the McDonald's value menu meal. And um, so we went from instead of obviously like burgers to kind of like grilled chicken sandwiches. We went from uh, kind of like an, a morning like sausage biscuit thing to kind of like uh, an egg wrap and there were some other healthy choices, healthier choices, in terms of caloric reduction and decreasing fats and sugars and trying to increase protein in the foods that they were picking. So that's where the client was. So instead of telling them that they needed to, you know, 
you know, go home and do all this food prep and cook all this and have this variety of vegetables, this variety of fruits, you know, make sure they had, you know, vegetables from all colors, like throughout the month, you know, or throughout the week. I mean, like instead of laying down all these crazy ass nutritional rules that they were never going to follow. And that was the problem of why they had not lost weight before was all the advice that they could get wasn't really practical for them. They couldn't figure out how to make it work. They had tried, they just couldn't figure it out. So my job was to simplify it and say, okay, if you're going to eat off McDonald's menu, how do we do so in a manner to get your weight down? So they ended up losing 30 pounds and they kept it off. And they lost 30 pounds, I believe it was in like four to six months, somewhere around like, I know it was in less than half a year. Uh, they lost 30 pounds. The next stage of the year, the next six months, I think they lost an additional like 10 or so. So they had a net loss in a year of around 40-ish to 50-ish pounds. And um, that's all they ever did was just they kept eating off the McDonald's menu. So they were able to lose 40 to 50 pounds in a year while still eating fast food and what we would consider as quote-unquote junky food. Now, we did do a little bit of supplements here and there to help with uh, some things that were missing from the diet, uh, nutritional things that were missing from the diet at McDonald's, but overwhelmingly, they got to kind of stay with their current lifestyle, but we, we taught them how to do more lifelong, sustainable, healthy choices out of their lifestyle. So that was the idea, was... I met the client where they were. As they made progress, I haven't kept in touch with this person, unfortunately. We just kind of faded away. But um, I hope now, a couple of years later, maybe some things about their home life and personal life have calmed down. Then they've been able to eat healthier in, in um, outside of uh, fast food. But what was interesting, and I thought the reason why I wanted to share that example was, my job as a trainer wasn't to harp on them about how bad fast food was and tell them all the things that they needed to do and all these other kind of basic um, nutritional stuff that we would consider to be true and healthy but wouldn't be possible, wouldn't be practical for that client. That client already knew all the stuff they should be doing. They didn't know how to get it done whilst meeting the rest of their life, so they were stuck. So my job was to simplify the process and bring the process to them where they were. And that's what I want to kind of promote you guys to do. I do not necessarily want to promote you to teach all your people how to eat off fast food, <laughs> but in the more so in the sense of simplifying things and getting rid of the clutter, getting rid of the overwhelmingness. So often clients are going to feel lost and they're going to feel like nothing works for them. They're going to feel like they're lost hope or lost cause. And our job is to say, hey, you know what? We can make a difference for you. This is how we're going to do it. We're going to start small, start where you're at, build up some habits, and then over time, maybe we can work on improving those habits. But let's get you started where you are. So that's the goal, okay? Is when your clients come to you, are you giving them easy to follow, clear directions that are achievable for where they're at? So let's think of nutrition, first of all, okay? It's important that we teach them the order of importance. So we have to teach them what is important in a diet. Is it important to eat organic or not? Is it important to eat brown rice rather than white rice? Or is it important to control calories? So where should they start? Typically, most people start by just trying to change what they're eating to a higher quality of food, in their opinion. So they're going to change, like I said, from like white bread to wheat bread. They're going to maybe change from white rice to brown rice. So if, if they go to, you know, Salsaritas or Moe's for lunch, all of a sudden they're going to get brown rice in their uh, burritos rather than white rice. Is that really significant? No, not at all. So they're going to make changes like that and then wonder why nothing is happening because it's the wrong changes, it's the wrong focus. So we know from podcast number 41 – We've already talked about it, that the most important component in terms of weight change is calories. If I need my weight to go down, I should eat less calories. If I need my weight to go up, I should eat more calories. Now, there is a too much calorie and a too little calorie, but in general, we know that the change in calories has the most impact 
and it's the most kind of important place to start. The second most important thing is making sure their protein intake is correct. Then is meal timing and meal frequency. Then we have macronutrient quality, which is like whether something's white rice versus brown rice, white bread versus wheat bread. So calories, protein intake, and meal timing are all more impactful, more important than whether something's organic or not, wheat or white, all those things. So that's what we need to teach our clients is, is, is the effort they're putting in being put into the best place, the place with the most significant effect. So that's the first thing we need to teach, is what is most important when you want to change your, your nutrition. So when I had the client who was eating at McDonald's, was it most important that I got them away from McDonald's foods to maybe like homemade foods? You know, would, you know, um, like a chicken sandwich made from home be better than a chicken sandwich made, you know, from McDonald's? Yeah, okay, it would have a better quality of nutrients in it, but it wouldn't be much different calorie-wise. So should this person undo all the things they have going on at home so they can prepare and make all their food to take with them to work? Well, I promise you this person didn't have the time for it, uh, but should I have wrestled with them and forced them to make that happen whenever that huge of a life change and that much in of like a severe... Um, kind of, uh, don't really know how to word this correctly, but they would have had to dig into time for their child and for other circumstances they had going on. And would that have been worth just the quality of nutrient change? Not really. They needed caloric change more than anything, not a change in the quality. So them having to undo their whole lifestyle of eating the McDonald's as a way of a means of giving them more time at home with their children. Okay. So that would not have been worth it. So me as a trainer, if I would have told them again, just like everybody else had told them that you need to spend less time with your children and more time preparing food, they would have done that. There would have been a big effect in their children, but there wouldn't have been a big effect on their weight loss because all they would have changed was the quality of the food, not the quantity. They wouldn't have changed calories. They wouldn't have changed protein intake. They wouldn't have changed their meal timing. They wouldn't have changed the most three impactful things. Instead, they would have changed only a fourth impactful thing, but through a change that would have been immensely impactful on their life. So I would have been doing them a disservice as a trainer to not have taught them the order of importance. So here they were beating themselves up, thinking they were never going to be able to get healthy because they couldn't find the time to do those nutritional things when they weren't even necessary. So that's where I feel bad is this person came to me hurting, emotionally hurting, with the wrestling with the fact of trying to take care of themselves and take care of their children. That is a, it's a, a horrible choice for anyone to have to make. But the information that they were being presented before they met with me was giving them only that choice. That's what everybody told them is you have to choose between yourself or your children. They're obviously going to pick their kids. So therefore they thought their health was a waste, a wash, when it was actually not true. So the people they talked to before maybe just didn't know any better, or if they did know any better, they're assholes for not giving them a better option. But that was the big thing was they didn't need to take away from their children to make their own health. So they were able to stay with the habits that they had created so they had time for their kids and still take care of their health. So that's why it's important to know the order of importance. Then, do we give them a structure? Do we give our clients a structure that allows them to address the order of importance of nutrition in a lifelong, sustainable way and in a way that they can achieve right now? So if you want somebody, um, I'm making some crazy examples here in the next couple of minutes just because I want to make the point. Um, but if you tell somebody, okay, instead of eating, you know, instead of going to the grocery store and getting a rotisserie chicken on the way home, okay, as your protein source, I want you to grow, like I want you to have chickens in your backyard and only eat fresh chickens and fresh eggs. And that's it. You have to kill the chickens yourself. <laughs> so I know it's a dumb example. 
But the point is, is, is there anything wrong with getting a rotisserie chicken from a grocery store? No. Is there anything wrong with growing your own chickens and eating them? No. But which one is more lifelong sustainable? <laughs> which one is more achievable with what the way a person can uh, live their life right now? So you have to find the things that are important and impactful in their nutritional health, but things that are sustainable that they can do for a long time and what they can do right now. So you want to find ways for your people to do nutritional changes that don't cause a huge disruption in their lifestyle because they won't do it. And you want to find ways for them to make nutritional changes that they're capable of. So a lot of times when I work with adults, even in their 30s and 40s, and even 50s, they don't know how to cook. So they have very little cooking skill. All they know how to do is to kind of like heat something up. So whether it's a microwave or just dump it into a frying pan and heat it up on a frying pan. But that's pretty much all they know. So sometimes if I want them to eat healthier foods, like say I want them to eat, you know, like um, let's just say chicken and rice. They honestly don't know how to cook rice and they honestly don't know how to cook the chicken correctly. That's That surprised the hell out of me when I started helping people uh, with nutrition when I was in my early 20s. But it was true. People didn't know how to cook. So I needed to give them either a way in which to prepare their food that they knew how or I needed to teach them how to cook. So I've actually gone to clients' houses before and taught them how to cook. I've gone to cl with clients to grocery stores and taught them how to shop. So uh, sometimes you have to show them something that's going to give them a way to make that thing possible right now. So if you give them a diet plan, but they can't actually do it. So if I told them I wanted to eat them to go get chicken breast, you know, from the butcher shop or whatever, and I want them to cut that up and cook it every night with rice, and they don't know how to do that, then that's, that advice I gave them is, is no use. It's not going to help. So you have to make sure the information you give them is something that they can do right now to make a change. So you can have the goal of progressive improvement. So maybe you have to give them a kind of standards now that you wouldn't want them to stay with forever, but they're going to work now. They're going to get the ball rolling. They're going to get some progress started. So that client I had to eat at McDonald's, do I want them to do that for the rest of their life? No. But is that the only thing they had possible at that time? Yeah. So you worked with where they were, and then you taught them over time on how to improve upon that. So maybe you have somebody do something for the first month or two just to get things started, and then you have a plan in a month or two to address it and clean it up better. That's fine. Okay, You can do progressive improvements, but make sure you start with where they are now. And then you have to have them track adherence, not results. Don't have them just track weight change. Have them track their adherence to the rules of the diet. The reason why is adherence is something that they can do all day, every day. Something that makes them feel like they're on track and being successful at all times. Whereas, if you weigh in, we already know body weight fluctuates immensely. Body weight can fluctuate within 2% for any reason whatsoever under the freaking sun. So we've talked about this is, you know, there's like whether their sodium levels change from one day to the next, maybe they were hyperactive one day, and then the next day they're having more water retention because of the dehydration and hyperactivity of the day before. So there's also change in freaking humidity. There's a whole bunch of stuff that can change our body weight. So if they're only measuring on a scale, they and say their goal is fat loss, like weight loss, and all of a sudden from one measurement to the next, they go up 0.2 pounds. They're actually going to feel like a failure just because they went up 2.2 pounds. Whenever 0.2 pounds is absolutely within the realm of complete randomness of how our body weight changes. So don't give them something to track that's random. Holy shit, how is that, like, how do we not know that that's <laughs> a thing that we should be doing, okay? So don't give them stuff to track that's completely random. Give them stuff to track that is 100% reflective of their efforts, and that is adherence. So give them an adherence chart or some type of tracking system that they can pay attention to every single day. And they can know the truth of their habits versus the intent of their habits. We all intend it to eat well. We all intend it to work out. But we don't. And we only get results for the things we do, not what we intend it to do. So give them some type of tracking system. Okay. 
Now, if we look at training, it's the same thing. So give them, like, teach them the order of importance. Resistance training and nutrition are significantly more important for uh, body fat loss while maintaining muscle mass and or building muscle while maintaining a little fat gain. So resistance training and nutrition are by far the most important things a person should focus on. Then they can add cardio. But cardio is absolutely not the most impactful thing for their efforts. Cardio is the least impactful thing for their efforts. So if somebody has 20 minutes, they should lift weights, not do cardio. If somebody's spending an hour on a cardio machine, and you as the trainer are telling them to do that, you are an asshole. You are wasting their time. You are telling them incorrect information. Educate yourself. Okay? So podcast 175 talks about the importance of strength. Podcast number 30 talks about muscle cardio. How to do cardio with weights. So that way not only do they lose fat, but they actually can maintain the muscle mass in their body, if not actually build more. And podcast 181 talks about using muscle damage for fat loss. How you can use muscle damage through lifting weights to get as much fat loss effect, if not more, than what you would get out of cardio. So if you are a trainer who advocates cardio as an effective means of fat loss, you are not intelligent in your field of information. You need to learn, okay? Now, I'm going to sound like a complete asshole on this. I used to do this. I used to have people do fasted morning cardio on a step mill. Hell, I did that myself. I did that where I would go on a step mill for an hour in a completely fasted state because at the time, that was what was touted as the best thing to be, okay, the best way to lose body fat. We've since found out that that was absolutely stupid, um, and that sucks that we all wasted time doing that. But there is new information that tells us that cardio is the least effective means of body weight control. Resistance training and proper nutrition are by far more effective. So that's the first areas you should focus on in your training. The least area you should focus on is cardio. And we need to focus on making our people stronger. So he said, podcast 175 talks about the importance of strength. You need to focus on strength first. So even if the person needs to lose weight, focus on strength first, then focus on making them super busy and burning calories. But strength is absolutely the most important because it has the most longevity effect towards overall health. And there's a whole bunch of other reasons. That's why there's an entire podcast about it. But that's podcast 175. So strength in resistance training is the most important you need to make your people stronger before you worry about anything else. Now, how do you balance making them stronger while still achieving all the other goals? Well, that's in podcast number 232. Big picture checklist for general programming. It allows you to cover everything that should be in a workout program and make sure it's balanced and make sure you don't miss anything. Podcast 232. So we need them to know that too. So that way they can understand how to get complete workouts and not miss anything. How many people do we know that would go to the gym and say, oh, I'm a little short on time. Let me just go do a bunch of cardio. When that's the stupidest way to spend their time. They should go lift heavy shit and get muscle damage. So that way the rest of the day, their body has to fix that muscle and it burns calories doing so. If they just jump on a piece of cardio equipment, the second they get off, their calories stop burning. Okay, maybe they do high-intensity interval training. They do hit cardio or Tabata cardio. Okay, so maybe after you're done, you continue to burn calories due to heart rate changes for maybe 20 up to 60 minutes. Maybe, I'll give you maybe one hour. But if you did resistance training and caused muscle damage, that could take 12 to 24 or even longer than 24 hours to fix, and you get significantly more calories burned in the long run. So if somebody's short on time, we need to educate them that resistance training is the best way to spend that time, not cardio, okay? 
And then again, same thing with training, uh, same thing with nutrition. As with their training, we should be tracking adherence. How often are they supposed to work out? How often are they actually working out? So we need to track all this stuff. So it's tempting to want to show knowledge through volumes of information. How much information can you spew forth at your client? That is tempting to allow us to feel like we're intelligent, but it's not intelligence. That is not true knowledge. True knowledge is to show how you can simplify volumes of information. So there's a term called post-complexity simplicity that was introduced to me by a really good friend, Paul. And um, essentially what it means is as you start to learn stuff, you'll think, oh man, I learned everything. I know everything now. As you continue to learn more about your topic, you realize, holy shit, there's a lot more to this than I knew. I don't know anything. <laughs> so you go from thinking you know everything to recognizing that you don't know everything. And then all of a sudden, as uh, the breadth of knowledge, in the, I mean, as the breadth of information becomes its greatest and you continue to work through it, you then can, you learn how to simplify away. So you realize, okay, yeah, this thing is a, a thing that I need to know of, but it's not very common, so I can kind of push that to the side. Or, oh, this thing is something I need to know of, but it's really rare. No one's really going to ever run into this, or it doesn't apply to this client. I can push that away. So all of a sudden, you start narrowing down the information, and you get back to simplicity. So post-complexity, simplicity. So again, that's how our learning process